Hello everyone, this is Dhanya Rajendran joining you from Bengaluru. Uh, the election campaign is coming to a close in Karnataka. The voting happens on the 10th of May. Um, it's been a very charged atmosphere here with both parties uh, and the, of course the both national parties and the JDS and the Amadi party which is also in the fray in Karnataka doing their campaigns. Um, so as the campaign comes to a close, I'm going to be in conversation with uh, Sugata Srinivasaraju. He is a, a vet, he's a senior journalist and author uh, and uh, of course someone who understands Karnataka very well. So uh, welcome to the show. The first you, question Daniel. I want to ask is what do you think of the campaign that has been happening till today? Because the Congress has sort of been sticking to the local issues. They have been speaking about local issues, whether it's inflation, cost of living, uh, caste census, etc. The BJP has been very consistent with this double uh, double engine sarkar. They have continuously been talking about that. Well, how do you perceive the entire campaign till now? Thank you, Dandia. Uh, you're right about uh, the Congress sticking to local issues. See, to the extent that uh, until this point, I don't think Rahul Gandhi or Priyanka Gandhi who have campaigned in Karnataka or even Sonia Gandhi who campaigned in Karnataka yesterday has uh, picked any national issue. For example, their pet issues like Adani, uh, crony capitalism, such things have not come up. The only kind of uh, insertion that we saw uh, uh, trying to create a kind of uh, national narrative was the Bajrangdal issue. Uh, except for that, I think the Congress has been focusing on corruption. Congress has been focusing on uh, the incompetence of the sitting government. So, so by and large, they have, uh, you know, stuck to the local local issues and local leaders, trying to present harmony between their leaders, trying to sort of even Mr. Karge, who's the national president of the Congress Party, has not picked on issues which may be considered pan-Indian. So Congress, it's a very, very significant thing that the Congress, uh, this I think is the first election, if I'm right, uh, where they have started behaving like a regional party. So in a way, they have conceded that there is only one national party, that is the BJP, and they have learned to behave like a regional party. And this, I think, is a logical extension of the argument that Rahul Gandhi has been making about the union of, uh, you know, India is a union of states and uh, things like that, which he spoke in parliament. So as an extension of that, there is an acknowledgement, however belated, of federal issues, trying to look at India as a federal polity. So I think that is something very significant. But could we also attribute to the fact, to two things, uh, that Congress has uh, very strong local leaders, regional leaders in Karnataka, unlike some other states. And second, the Congress doesn't want to position itself against uh, Narendra Modi on a national scale. Yeah, but you know, I mean, you have seen campaigns in Gujarat, you've seen campaigns elsewhere. Uh, they have had very, very strong leaders, even in other states. It's not that the Congress uh, did not have strong leaders there, but then they uh, they were a little ambivalent about what they need to focus on. In fact, the Gujarat campaign was so bad that they just did not campaign. In fact, uh, I mean, I know of a certain, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I, I know what happened behind the scenes where the BJP leaders were provoking certain very senior Congress leaders saying, you at least come and, uh, you know, I mean, Gali to the Modi ko. At least insult Gadi, ga, insult Modi, at least for that reason why don't you come and campaign in Gujarat. So Gujarat, they completely, they were doing the Yatra and they thought the Yatra was a bigger message and the Yatra was a pan-Indian kind of a thing. But even if you look at Karnataka, they have not even spoken about the Yatra. They have not just uttered a word or been emphatic. They may have spoken about the Yatra, but they have not been emphatic about the Bharat Jodo Yatra at all. And even mm -hmm. when the Bharat Jodo Yatra, I mean, you have you have looked at it far more closely than I have because you've been on the field. So even when they were crossing Karnataka, I don't think they picked electoral issues, although the elections were just a few months away. So it happened in September. They walked through Karnataka in October. And the constant complaint that you heard from Congress leaders in Karnataka at that point was uh, Mr. Rahul Gandhi was not doing what they want him to do. That is, 
uh, you know, I mean, pick a few local things. So he was trying to focus on a very, very large pan-India narrative. And that is what they stuck to then. And now you see a complete shift. Although the narrative has been changing, uh, the general campaign narrative has been changing, uh, primarily they have stuck to local uh, issues is right. Uh, and, and they have not raised anything else. So everyone who reports from Karnataka, the people from here and those who come from outside, everyone notices that caste plays a very important role in the Karnataka election. For those watching, can you explain how important is caste and how is it different from other states when you look, look at Karnataka and its elections? See, caste, Dhanya, is important across India. It's just that, you know, I mean, a lot of Anglophone media does not acknowledge that. But if you are reading, say, a Bihar, a, a, a Hindi reporter writing about Bihar elections, or I have worked in Rajasthan uh, long back. So if you if you sort of read a, a Hindi reporter writing on the Rajasthan election, you will always see these uh, social engineering aspects or social justice aspects coming up constantly. But I do agree that Karnataka is a special case case where the caste, you know, I mean, if you use a very Marxist analogy, it forms the uh, base structure and a lot of things are built over that. The superstructure is built on the caste thing. So the caste forms a kind of base structure here in, in campaigning, in, uh, in the way uh, politics is done, in the way elections are conceived, in the way tickets are distributed, in the way issues are picked. And, uh, and I think that's foundational in Karnataka. But I have said this earlier too, this may be a transitional election. Because I think, I mean, I may be completely wrong, but I think the BJP is trying to do something very, very interesting. The experiment may fail or it may, it may sort of take off, is that they're shaking up the status quo that has been, uh, uh, I mean, that, that's existed about caste politics in Karnataka for, since the 70s, since the, uh, since the time Devrajara shook it up completely from the 70s till now. See, that is reflected in the vote shares. All the parties, except when the Janta Dal has broken down or splintered, I mean, uh, the Congress has seen a spike in its vote share. Otherwise, all the parties have seen a certain kind of uh, stagnation in their vote shares. And that is because the social engineering aspect or the social justice aspect, as one would like to call it, or the caste combinations have remained uh, kind of static. So this election, it may be the first election where the BJP is attempting to shake it a little and we may start seeing something else by the time we have the next assembly elections. So caste is central in Karnataka for the simple reason that the first backward class reservations, even before Mandal, see Mandal happens, uh, the, the whole idea of the Mandal uh, you know, I mean, commission comes up during Murarji's time as under his prime ministership. So even before that, there is the Havnur Commission in Karnataka. Mm -hmm. Havnur has already, uh, you know, given his report, and Devrajar is during the uh, during his reign of eight eight and a half years implemented the Havnur Commission, and OBC reservations were given. The Mandal that uh, that shook up the nation after V P Singh accepted it in eighty nine, and uh, then you know you see the whole upheaval that happened in North Indian politics even before that a silent, quieter reservation had happened. I mean, a process of, uh, uh, you know, I mean, reservations, OBC reservations had happened in Karnataka. So Karnataka has seen all of it before the nation saw it. And so how do you say that the BJP is trying to challenge the status quo as far as caste politics in Karnataka is yes. concerned? That's, that's, very, that's an interesting question. That is because, see, until now, the perception was Say, I'll give you the example of Lingayats. Lingayats were seen as one voting block. See, you never heard of the splintering of the Lingayats, uh, I mean, the, the, the voting block. You, you never spoke of subcast going the other way. But this time, what has happened with the Dalit vote and the Lingayat vote, the BJP has tried to give internal reservations, at least made a kind of symbolic gesture. It is still not implemented, as you know, it has to go through a lot of. Uh, challenges in the courts as well as in the parliament. It's still not out there happening, but there is an indication, there is an intent that has been made known. They've, they've, they've expressed their intent to do it, and that is being 
sold to the electorate as uh, something that will happen if they come back to power. And you see, and in, in the case of reservations, always you can never withdraw what has been given. Once the population or the demography becomes aware of it, and one political party sort of expresses its uh, intention to give it, the another political party can, cannot come and say, I'm going to take it back from you. So it will create a different kind of rupture. So BJP, what it has done is it has splint, tried to splinter the uh, Okali, I mean, sorry, Lingayat uh, block by giving Pancham Sali some kind of preference. And Pancham Salis are the biggest subsect within the Lingayats. And they were not as empowered as the other subsects, which were smaller in number. See, if I give you one analogy, it will become very, uh, example, it will become uh, clear. See, all the chief ministers of Karnataka, except for senior and junior Bombay, have all belonged to one particular subsect of the Lingayats, which is the trading subsect called the Banajigas. Bombay senior and Bombay junior belong to a subsect called Sadars. Uh, so, and the Pancham Salis, the demand in the last two years, you have seen all the protests that were taking place and, you know, the Swamiji sitting on a dharna for months together, the entire community rallying around them. And even when the transition was happening between Yadurappa and Bombay, the demand was a Pancham Sali be made a chief minister. That is why the name of a, a Nirani came up. Nirani is a Pancham Sali Lingai. That is why the name of a Basuraj Patil Yatnal came up, a man who's always seen abusing B.S. Yadurappa. You know, there was something like that had never happened in Karnataka. Yadurappa was an unchallenged, tall leader of the Lingayats. But Basuraj Patil Yatnal, how much ever he abused Yadurappa and his son in the last one, one and a half years, has never been thrown out of the party. I don't think his... Uh, there's been any disciplinary action on him. He's contesting an election this time. So I think it's a very, very measured kind of decision to allow these provocations inside the Lingayat quarter so that the Pancham Salis are on your side. And if the rest of them try to, you know, I mean, uh, uh, are, are unhappy about it, it only uh, brings the Pancham Salis together because if a smaller subsect objects to a bigger subset getting uh, reservations or a bit of quota extra points. I mean, I think uh, there will be even more greater kind of uh, animosity. So I think BJP is trying to play that game. Therefore, one hmm. last point on this. Therefore, a uh, shatter going out is not seen as a major thing within the BJP. See, shatter may be an RSS man. He may have been a chief minister. This whole thing of Gaddari that has been attributed to all that rhetoric will be there, but he belongs to the Banajiga subsect. So the Pancham, the Pancham Salis are probably feeling a little more lighter and happy that one big Banajiga person is out. So our uh, our route to power is probably far more clear. Hmm. So you're saying Shetar's exit will not make the Lingayats as a block be angry with the BJP one. So I have lots of questions to ask from what you said, but I think I should begin from the fact that why do you think BJP went for the shake-up in the last minute to announce his internal, internal reservations? Did the BJP by then, before the elections were announced, believe that the Lingayats, especially the Pancham Shalis, were moving away from them? No, not really. I think the see the whole thing was when Bombay became the chief minister in, uh, was it 21 of July? I think around that time. See, the intention of the BJP was to create a more universal electorate. See, when I say it was the intention, I mean, I'm. this is my reading like you as a journalist. So it's it's a reading. So so they were trying to create a more universal electorate, which is a Hindutva electorate. See, if you look at BJP, it's very comfortable creating a kind of bipolar narrative where it says, I am a Hindu, you are not a Hindu. Or you are national, I am anti-national. You know, it's like that kind of bipolar, binary narrative is something that the BJP thrives on. And, you know, I mean, not giving any tickets to Muslim and Muslims and, you know, the rest of them looked at in a certain way. So the BJP wanted to create a universal electorate even in Karnataka or a binary electorate even in Karnataka, which was not the case in Karnataka till then. In Karnataka, see, whether we like it or not, this multiplicity of castes and multiplicity of worldviews that these castes bring in 
had created a very diverse kind of electoral environment. And BJP wanted to create two narratives, which makes it easier for them to win an election, which is anti-Congress narrative, which is an anti trying to make them look like anti-nationals or trying to bucket uh, Muslims in a certain way and polarize the state. So they started out with that. It's not that they wanted to arrive at caste uh, uh, immediately. Uh, these quota and other things were a, I mean, I, I think was a afterthought. So first they started out with a Hindutva kind of narrative and an agenda. And therefore, when Bomai stepped in, what was he talking? He was saying action and reaction. Every action will have a reaction. Then he started speaking about hijab. Then he started speaking about halal. Then he started speaking about azan. Then, you know, I mean, he started speaking about Anjanadri, Hanuman Janmabhumi. Then there was a Ram temple thing that was coming up. Well, oh, there was a whole bunch of narrators that were being thrown at people. Right? So, so they, that they thought, they were gauging. See, BJP, whether we like the party or not, is a party that experiments quite a bit and gauges uh, the reaction, goes back, brings in a corrective, tries to balance, you know, does a lot of things. So they were gauging how this narrative is picking up. And for, uh, I mean, they were, uh, when, when, when they sort of tried to read this, they understood that it was not picking up as much as they wanted across the state. So they, they, were, they had no qualms. They just dropped everything. In fact, they dropped it to such an extent that in I was just watching one of the uh, shows, you know, I mean, uh, uh, some kind of a conclave that a television channel had in Bangalore, where uh, Bomai was asked about uh, Hindutva, and he suddenly started blaming the anchor and the television channel. This and was the media. India Today conclave, and Bomai told Rahul Kanwal, the media is bothered about uh, Hijab yeah. and Halal, not us. Hijab and Halal. Uh, probably Rahul Kanwal had a certain brief to sort of ask that question. I don't know. But I mean, I was really surprised with Bombay trying to push him back on the whole thing. And mm. Bombay pushing that back looked a little ridiculous because you and I, as residents of Bangalore and Karnataka, have witnessed what Bombay was trying to do. You saw what kind of battles, pitched battles were, uh, you know, I mean, uh, held when, it, when the hijab thing happened, when the halal thing happened, or trying to deny Muslims their economic kind of space. Uh, and, and this is a state which has the highest kind of syncretic points, right? So, so you are saying when the Hindutva narrative did not work, they, their new experiment was with the internal reservations. Absolutely. So when they realized that this whole thing is not working to the level that they wanted, they thought we will take a different route. See, please don't be confused that they have given it up. No, they have not. They will never because that's their primary agenda. What they are trying to do is they are to, trying to take a certain different route, slightly different route, which is splinter the caste quota. If you go on giving reservation within reservation, the last judgment of the Arun Mishra, I mean Arun Mishra, Justice Arun Mishra in the Supreme Court was about internal reservation. And that was a huge signal. And the BJP picked it up first. And when you start slicing the pie, which is a limited pie, now whatever reservations these people have announced in the last leg of before going to elections, crosses the 50% limit that uh, the, 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 the uh, Supreme Court has set. It goes to 56%. And that is EWS and all that put together will sort of create a further more confusing picture. So if you start splintering the caste pie with further quota, internal reservations, then when people, the expectation or the hope, perhaps, perhaps that they have, is that people will realize that, you know, I mean, getting quota doesn't really matter because it's so small and so, so intensely, there's such intense competition that there is no point in seeking that. So probably that is the kind of logic that is operating. So they've declared this. And see, there is a, in 1994, something very similar happened with the Virap Moili government. When he was confronted by the Okaligas, he gave reservations to everybody right, left, and center. You know, is that what Sidramaya is doing now? He has promised 75% reservation. Yeah, yeah Sidramaya has, I mean, I have a feeling that Sidramaya has done it mindlessly. See, the Congress is a party that only reacts to the agenda that the BJP sets. The Congress has not set the agenda on anything today. If you look at 
you know, uh, uh, the whole thing, except for corruption. And corruption is also an agenda that people like you, uh, that is the media in Karnataka set, right? It is something that they picked up. It's not that a Congress person discovered a scam and held a press conference. It was Danya who was speaking about voting scam or somebody else speaking about something else. And it was the media which set that agenda. So Congress per se believes in getting power by default. And that is why their vote share has somewhat stagnated. And I've told you earlier that it spiked only when the opposition splintered. Even 2013, although Ballari was a very big issue in 2013, if you remember, the Ballari mining issue, Sidramaya had done as Padhyatra. Yeah, that did give an air cover. But finally, what is it that defeated the BJP? It is the it is Yadurappa going out, taking away his 8%, then Sri Ramulu going out, taking away his 4%, the Valmiki vote, the Lingayat vote splintering. And what was the vote share of the Congress party which came to power? It was a minuscule 34%, around 34%. And what is the vote share that they got in 2018 when they got just 75 seats and the BJP was united? They got 37%, but they still got lower number of seats. So this should explain that caste, which is a question that you asked me earlier, is so central that you know these alignments changing can quickly change the voting blocks. That is, that is how Karnataka has behaved so far. I mean, it may change is what I feel. But do you believe there is any sort of consolidation, whether it's the Vokkaliga vote for the JDS or the Lingayats, even the subsects? Do you perceive any sort of consolidation for any party this time? No, it has never happened. See, consolidation has never meant, Danya, 100% one community voting in a certain... The BJP, even in the best of scenarios, has got about 65-70% of the Lingayats voting for them. So the 30% gets scattered here and there. Similarly, although we call Janta Dal a Vokaliga has its base in the Okaliga region, I don't think they've got more than 40% Okaliga vote at any given point of time. Right? That is after 1999. So, so no political party can uh, think of getting a complete end block, whatever. The percentages may vary by, there may be a 2 or 3% swing. But that 2 or 3% swing is what every party wise for because there is a stagnated vote share as I told you. There is a 30, mm. see BJP, even its worst, in its worst situ, uh, kind of condition will deliver some 30% because there is a certain kind of, you know, I mean loyalty to the party which will deliver 30% vote share. The JDS has oscillated between 19 and 20%, 18 and 20% vote share. Come what may, whoever campaigns, whatever happens, that has been their vote share. Congress, 33 to 35% has been its average vote share since 82. I'm using the 82 benchmark is because that is the first time that a non-Congress government came to power in Karnataka and Hegde became the chief minister. And a lot of 70s experiments were you know, playing out in a completely different way. So we don't know whether there is that kind of consolidation happening behind a party. It may be like the earlier case, but with an extra 2% or 3%. Or the Lingayats may, may I mean, because of the uh, kind of uh, splintering that we see, 2 or 3% may come down. But it may not affect the uh, strike rate of the BJP. We don't know that. That is something to be said. You're saying the internal rate. reservations were brought in by the BJP to see if the 2 to 3% swinging vote is an experiment they are doing to see if they can swing at least 2 to 3% vote, right? And no, you're not no. sure whether that experiment will work or not. No, the two, three, two to three percent swing is not from the lingayats that they are expecting. Of course, you know they are only looking at one major subsect. The two to three percent subsect, yeah, is is probably their Hindutva narrative. Probably the two to three percent is probably the Modi roadshows and rallies and all that. See, one thing has become very clear: the BJP vote bank is one part of the story. Modi, as an independent brand, commands a certain kind of uh, vote percentage. So they are trying to increase that. If you look at the narrative right from the beginning, when the national leaders started campaigning, what did they say? They said, forget everything, trust Modi. Amit so Shah they're doing that open, even today, right? Even, With even the today final. Yeah. That is because they realize that BJP, I mean, vote, vote, bank, vote bank as quote unquote vote bank, they may not like the phrase, but BJP's essential core voter Maybe intact, maybe around 28, 30%. That would be 
So the rest of it has to come from the Modi swing. So they are probably working on that. They have not so much, you know, I mean, they, they hope, see, the internal reservation given for Dalits, it's not something new because the Madhigas had already shifted and they were already voting for the BJP. See, uh, interestingly, all these social engineering experiments had been carried out by Edurapa. He had consolidated the vote share for them in some ways. Bombay with the reservation thing is only confirming certain things. Except for the Pancham Sali thing, everything else that he's trying to do is just a confirmation and a reconfirmation of what Yadiropa had done. For example, we don't seem to talk about the backward class vote at all. See, there are 100, 108 odd communities. That's the backward class vote. And they're a sizable chunk of... They, see, they're not a social... There is no social... Uh, it's not a social group. They are splintered. They are, they are small communities. And they come together only for economic advantage at times. That is how uh, Devrajar has brought them together and kept them together for 8 or 10 years. Bangarapa tried to do that. But we, we have not had a big backward class leader after Bangarapa who has been able to command all the 108 castes or the majority of those castes. Now, you may ask me this question as to what is Sidramaya doing? He's seen as a backward class leader. But Sidramaya, I've always argued uh, in, and, and also been abused for this by the Congress trolls, that actually in Karnataka today, it's Yadurapa who is the backward class leader. Because if you look at 108 uh, uh, castes listed in the OBC list, majority of them are loyal to Yadurapa or have been loyal until this point. So Except a lot of the BJP's fortunes also hinges on BS Yadurapa. No, I mean OBCs. Hmm. Yadurapa okay. may be a conduit to getting that. We don't hmm. know how much. See, we have to. We have nobody has studied this, Danya. We don't know how intact the Edurapa brand is still. Whether the Modi brand overrides all that. Because Modi is also an OBC. And 30-40% of the population, we don't know how they are going to decide on this whole thing. See, 8% or 7% or 6%, we don't know the exact number. The Kurubas may go in a certain way. The Edigas have already splintered. right? One of the tallest socialist Ediga leaders from the Shumoga region his daughter crossed over to the BJP just before the tickets were being distributed. So all these ruptures have started happening. And it's very interesting to see which community is going to vote in a consolidated. Dalits are not going to vote in a consolidated fashion. Lingayats are not going to vote in a consolidated fashion. The Okaligas have never sort of voted like that. It's always a split between the Congress and the, and the JDS. And JDS may get a slightly more thing. Uh, um, more uh, greater share that's that's a separate thing or may get a greater strike rate that's more accurate to say so but but otherwise we don't know how the muslims probably are going to behave they're 13 percent of the population because you have seen what oic is speaking oic has attacked sonia gandhi for uh, going and uh, pleading for oaths of jagdish shatter who was an rss man till the other day so we don't know what OIC is trying to do. We don't know what's going to happen in the Hyderabad, Karnataka region, which borders Telangana, where KCR is pretty influential. Because if you look at, if you stand in Raichur and look on the other side, it looks very green. Raichur is a very barren kind of a district where uh, not much of development has taken place. But if you look across the Indira Gandhi Canal or Indira Priyadarshini Canal, there's a greenery that these people see, and there's an aspirational element in those districts, which is not being captured. So we don't mm. know what role KCR is playing, because KCR is completely anti-Congress, anti-BJP. And he has a great friendship with the JDS. And mm. then you also know about the SDPI. And the SDPI, we don't know how tactical voting will be done by SDPI, because it's a small organization, and they'll play a very intelligent role. They may not win a seat. They have already made in they, are contesting. In they are contesting also. And they I are think contesting. Yeah, they are contesting a small number of seats, but the signaling will be very different. One mm. and two, at the gram panchayat level, they are already members. They have won elections, so this is not something that is being factored at all. So I think we are looking at large narratives. It may still work in the favor of the Congress, and Congress may emerge as the single largest party. But I will not take a bet to say that somebody will get an absolute majority. We'll have to wait and see how the last few days play out.
So I want to ask about B.S. Yadurappa again. There are two narratives, right? One is that Yadurappa himself is not happy with what is happening, and that uh, the Lingayats also believe, at least a section of the Lingayats believe, that he has been sidelined. That is one. Second is his talk about who will be the next chief minister if the BJP wins. That uh, it is something that Kumaraswamy first brought up a few months before the election. That Prahlad Joshi and B.L. Santosh and other Brahmin leaders want a Brahmin chief minister. and therefore voting for the bjp would give you a brahmin chief minister and after that there have been comments by various bjp leaders that sort of reinforces that if they do come to power there is a chance that the chief minister may not be a bokkaliga or a lingai how crucial is that also so two things one is uh, about ps yadurappa and the lingayats feeling that he has been sidelined and second what role does this whole fear that it could be a brahmin cm next play in these elections the bs edurappa thing that you asked is very interesting you know but who is building that narrative is the question it's the it's the congress leaders and the jds leaders who are telling you that edurappa has been signed they seem to be crying more than the bjp leaders and you know I mean it may work a completely different way edurappa if modi or some senior bjp leader turns around and says that you know I mean uh, don't trust people who are trying to sabotage your party and uh, if that means that uh, edurappa is part of one of those sabotages like it happened in 2013 then the signaling will be very different to the voter the core voter so we don't know whether the, 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 that whole narrative about bs edurappa is a narrative that is being built up mostly by the congress see there was a particular day in april where after shatter crossed over where mb patil who's the apparent face of the lingayats in the congress party tweets repeatedly not once not twice but at least three four tweets saying that we welcome the lingayats back home so is is that something that is real is the question and why are you saying this you are saying this because shatter has crossed over and shatter is of the same sectors as bs edurappa so all that we spoke just before this applies so how will the how are the pancham salis viewing edurappa the pancham salis have been abusing edurappa there was a public meeting i i don't know if you recall this a few couple of years ago when edurappa was still chief minister and the pancham sali chief minister uh, pontiff raised this issue about making a pancham sali the chief minister when edurappa was still the sitting chief minister of the state and edurappa just flared up he was very unhappy he left the i think he left the meeting or he just asked the swami ji or the pontiff to just keep quiet or they had to be sort of pacified and all that so look at the dynamics inside so i am not sure if the edurappa factor is a factor that is being raised inside the bjp or by the pancham salis or by all lingayats or if it's a narrative of the congress see unfortunately what we don't do and especially in the context of this election we should be probably doing a little more diligently is we fact check the bjp all the time we check, fact check their propaganda all the time but do we apply that same yardstick to the other two parties is the question they also have their narratives like the caste census for example which the congress yes. has been saying we bring out but the congress did not publish the caste census absolutely this had done and when we absolutely. asked the congress leaders they said when we come to power now we'll publish but why didn't you publish it when you were in power it was ready in 2016 i was an editor at that time we wrote editorials asking uh, mean chief minister sidramaiya to put it out because the numbers were looking very very different for major castes that is the reason why they didn't put out it would have been a complete upheaval and the bjp may go on go ahead and do it because it may it may favor this binary narrative that i am i spoke to you about which so is bokkaliga no the hindutva and non hindutva narrative if so you one put question, out the actual figures yeah so are uh, uh, the brahmin question you have to answer the brahmin chief minister yeah. i have couple of questions which have come to ask yeah. if you could so the Bra- the brahmin question is see that's again the narrative of the opposition i think it was mr kumar swami who said the the peshwas are it is they are trying to bring in the maratha element there so so by saying the peshwa mindset is working over time and i think they also have memories of ramkrishna hegde having usurped the chair from deve gowda so all that will work in their constituency but that's the narrative of the opposition it's not 
it's it's a it, they have their right to peddle that narrative but no but, i don't but think the concern amongst the lingayats or the bokkaligas that yeah. they may not be they may not be becoming the chief minister no i mean i mean why is it that uh, i mean i don't think that concern has come to the top I mean, there is that element i mean i'm not denying it in fact in my column i did write that the brahmin versus lingayat narrative is being pushed quite a bit that that narrative exists but why is it that nobody is asking will a dalit for the first time be made a chief minister that's a very significant question right see someone like a right dalit which is uh, mr muniappa for the first time is contesting an assembly seat in kolar what if the congress comes to power and everybody is fighting and muniappa is becomes the top contender for the chair he is a right dalit majority of the dalit internal reservation the bjp has given to right dalits to so, so for the congress it may be a great strategy to bring all the majority of the dalits around them by making a right dalit nobody is speaking about that because the whole narrative is centered around lingayats and okaligas because the, they have played this whole political dominance game for the last 60 years 65 that's years. the question i have actually the question to you is is the lingayat factor overrated in karnataka elections uh, you know this whole perception that whoever the lingayats votes for can win the election no see lingayats alone cannot win a majority in any election in fact i wrote about this thing during the time of nijlingappa there was an assessment made where with a kind of full hardiness they try to assess what will happen if all the lingayats every single person votes for uh, you know the congress o what will happen how many seats will we get there was a simple assessment done now they wouldn't be crossing 40 30 or 40 or or 26 or, I mean, that is the that's the weak number that they had so if you look at the demographics of karnataka no single party that is no single dominant a uh, community can win an election on its own it needs at least at least two uh, you know i mean supporting castes to to push them up to the victory board so in so that is the reason why for a very long time okkaligas and kurubas were a combination then okkaligas kurubas and valmikis became a combination so why did yadurappa play the game of lingayats plus backwards plus valmikis plus madigas in spite of that he never got a majority he was, he had the most inclusive broad based caste uh, kind of combination working for him but in spite of it he did not get a majority both the times 2008 and 2018 they fell short of majority and you know what happened after that operation lotus blah 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 blah, blah. so so, so that was the are- thing okay the, the, to those those watching you can send questions in the comments i will ask it to mr sugata i have one question based on what you are saying if the bjp does win is there a chance of someone like yathnal or murugesh nirani becoming the chief minister that's a million dollar question then yeah you know you, you you and i should try answering that question we don't know see look at haryana what happened in haryana were the the jats were dominant in the in the political landscape there but who became the chief minister and he's a second term chief minister so the, so the bjp has a way of playing a completely entirely different game we don't know see if i read it correctly i don't think they want to get stuck with the lingayat narrative in in karnataka i think they know that there is a certain kind of saturation that has uh, it, that it has reached trying to play the lingayat card for too long so i think they may try to break free from that they may create a lovely space for lingayats within that kind of government they form but they may their instinct may work slightly differently is what i feel so murgesh nirani and yatnal yatnal and murgesh nirani may have to wait uh, hmm. yatnal certainly not because yatnal is seen as a kind of a loose cannon and the stature part of it may not work nirani has a lot of money but having a lot of money also has a lot of vulnerabilities and yatnal may himself yatnal has been challenging nirani so if the two it's like the two yadavs fighting in 1996 you know mulayam and lalu creating a third option in devegowda as a prime minister it's like that so if the two nantam sali are fighting even go for a third option and break free from this whole lingayat uh, 
I, I have a feeling. I may be wrong. I have a feeling that it may happen. I have, okay. That's the feeling. Just moving away from the cast uh, segment. I mean, I would like to tell people again, watching through different forums, if you have any questions, please post it. The BJP has been very consistent about this double engine Sarkara. Today I was reading this interview, I think, uh, by Sudhindra Kulkarni uh, in the in the Times of India, one of the papers, that he's saying that this is completely against federalism. Uh, but I don't know if that message is going across, right? From the Prime Minister to everyone campaigning for the BJP, they keep speaking about this double engine Sarkara. But do you believe that the JDS and Congress has countered this properly here? See, the double engine thing, the Congress has no locus standi to counter that narrative because the Congress has always, you know, I mean, the moment you say double engine, they'll say you did it for the longest period. You you sort of dismiss governments. You know, that is the rhetoric that Modi has always used in parliament and outside parliament, saying that how many governments did you dismiss? You know, misusing the provisions, Article uh, 356 or whatever. You know, you've dismissed so many governments. Indira Gandhi uh, uh, dismissed a lot of governments. Rajiv Gandhi you know, there's a very bitter memory in Karnataka about Rajiv Gandhi dismissing the tallest, one of the tallest Lingayat leaders from the airport. He said, I'm going to change the chief minister. Virendra Patil had suffered a stroke and you should have been more sympathetic and empathetic. And you said, you go, you, have, you visit him, then you go to the airport and you say, I'm going to change the chief minister. That is that and Lingayat's moved away permanently is what is said about that episode. And then there is another episode about uh, Nijlingappa. Nijlingappa was insulted by Indira Gandhi. So Nijlingappa, you know, the Congress broke up under when Nijlingappa, like Karge, was the chief of the Congress party, national chief of the Congress party. So there are two bitter episodes that is in, uh, that's, that's there in the memory of the Karnataka electorate. And, and the other parties constantly keep reminding voters that this has happened, this has happened, Indira Gandhi, Rajiv Gandhi, Sonia Gandhi, you know, Sonia Gandhi did not dismiss government, to be fair. But then, you know, they, they keep reminding, they keep jogging your memory on that. So the Congress does not have a local standard. But the, the, the JDS has a local standard on that. But the JDS, I feel, built that narrative a little delayed, in a delayed fashion. And also, you know, I mean, they were trying to play on the Kannada aspect, you know, I mean, Canada pride, Canada this, Canada that. If you look at electorally in Karnataka, the Canada pride thing has never worked because this is a state which has not emotionally integrated itself well. The Tamil uh, narrative has worked a little uh, better or has, has been consolidated from the time of Periyar and Anadurai and you know, you know all the 50s and 60s and that even when a strong opposition was created, they still built on that narrative of a Dravidian identity. See, the Dra interestingly, the Dravidian identity, when they speak, when the Tamils speak of the Dravidian identity, they only think of Tamils as Dravidians. They don't extend that argument to the Kanadigas or anybody else. So it's a very in exclusive kind of identity that they have built for themselves. And that is for, ele they have electorally gained on that. That is something that the BJP has tried to break in Tamil Nadu. But Recently, Mr. Deve Gowda as well as Kumar Swami, I think pointed uh, the voters' attention towards Tamil Nadu and they said, look at what happens in Tamil Nadu. They vote with such pride. But pride is something that has never worked in Karnataka. So you're saying that, unlike in Tamil Nadu, where there is a sentiment, this is a national party, which does damage to federalism, to language yes, rights, etc. Yes, yes, that sentiment yes. is not there in Karnataka, which no, the that BJP... Is because, that, is, that is because the political parties here have not consistently and, you know, I mean, uh, meticulously built that whole thing. See, it's one thing to just create a rhetoric, Dhania. The other mm. thing is to go out and build so many cultural extensions for that to be believed. What do you do here? You you speak of so much about Kannada, but look at what's happening in coastal Karnataka. The primary language is Tulu. Then there is Konkani. Then there is Byari. Then you, then there is Dakni. Then, you know, every Karnataka district, I mean, a lot of voters and your listeners may be surprised, except for four or five primarily Kannada speaking districts, most of the Karnataka region is a trilingual area or a bilingual area. So if you go to Kolar, you have three languages working. If you go to Belagam, again, two or three languages working. You go to coastal belt, you have four or five languages working. 
So there is a market language, there is a kitchen language, there is a living room language, there is an educational academic language. So, so Karnataka, there is, you know, you this this whole pride and whole thing, you you could have harnessed it, provided you had built that kind of consolidated argument through and through, and you know, been uh, been otherwise, you know, I mean anybody who contested on the Canada Pride issue in the past should have won. See, I remember, uh, I think a I think a BPMP election or some local body election, which was fought by uh, the uh, Rajkumar Fans Association or something like that. I, I don't remember the exact details, uh, but they lost completely. Even at the height of Rajkumar's, uh, you know, I mean, uh, popularity in Karnataka. So it has never worked that way. See, Devrajan has always had this thing that uh, Devrajan was an extremely mature politician. So he always said the industry should be kept out. And the film actor should be kept out, and you know, I mean, uh, uh, you you should always create a kind of political class and political engagement, and that is real democracy. But today, this, Karnataka is full of political parties with industrialists and businessmen. Absolutely, real estate I, men, even more specific. Exactly. I want to ask about JDS since you broached upon the JDS, and I think one, two or three more questions, and we'll end the session. Yes. You understand yes. the JDS very well. You have written a book on uh, Deva Gauda. The question always is, will JDS become the kingmakers? Their, uh, Congress leaders have spoken to say that they believe perhaps the JDS can go with the BJP this time. JDS says no BJP, no Congress for us, we'll be there. What is your reading? Uh, will uh, even uh, when some of the channels, they keep speaking about how Deva Gauda will not want to go with the BJP, but Kumara Swami will want to. What do you think uh, is, the BJ, uh, is the JDS thinking? See, both the Congress and the BJP, if I have watched the campaign a little closely, have always tried to brand. See, the Modi called in, I think, uh, somewhere yeah. campaigning, he called he them as the B team of the Congress. Congress. Yes. Yeah. So he called them the B team of the Congress. And the Congress has called them the B team of the BJP. So it's a narrative that the two national parties, because, you know, this 3 to 4% swing is crucial. Mm. They know at any given time. JDS will retain its 20% or 18 or 19%, you know, the average I'm talking about. So they want that extra swing in the old Mysore region to come their way. So they are bound to speak that language. But in my assessment, that is a space that a political party has grown for itself. So it is not a space that hinges or relies on a national party's concession to it. So no, my question is that that when the results come. Do you believe that, for example, a CPIM would not uh, align with the BJP now, right? Because ideologically, they are very different. They cannot align with the BJP. Yes. Do you believe for the JDS, it's a no for the BJP? Or do you think they may align with either the BJP or the Congress? No, if you look at, I think 2024 is in front of them. Hmm. And if the 2024 narrative is to be looked at, I think it, and look at their friends. Mamta Banerjee is their friend. She's very close to the yeah. JDS. Uh, KCR is close to them. Nitish, I know, is constantly talking to Deva Gauda because he's the patriarch of the old Jantav Parivar. And you have, they have uh, a line with Stalin. So if you look at that, I have reasons to believe that they will be far more cautious. See, in politics, you and I can't take bets. But, you know, they, I think they are far more cautious. And let to be fair to uh, the Jantav Dal, which I recount in my book, See, the 2006 episode almost killed Mr. Deva Gauda because he, uh, the, the Kumar Swami walking away with BJP. So in his lifetime, that may not be a possibility is what I feel in Deva Gauda's lifetime. So it may become very, it may hinge on his health and his sentiment and his kind of stature. That's number one. I, mean, I, I agree with it's you. In fact, thing. I believe that Deva Gauda would not be... And Kumar uh, Swami, I'm coming to that point. Kumar hmm. Swami also... In mm. 2019, this fact has not been challenged by Modi because I directly name Modi in my book. Modi pulls aside uh, in, when when the Congress was trying to disturb and Sidramaya, uh, I mean Sidramaya's followers were crossing over to the Edurappa camp to prop up a government in Karnataka in coalition. All of them believe that this would this is not the Sidramaya thing doing, but most of the people who crossed over were Sidramaya's followers, as you know, as I know, the 17 odd people so and they were most of them were obcs okay and at that point 
Modi pulls aside Kumar Swami at the Niti Aayog meeting or the national, I think the NDA meeting or something, and he says, "You resign now. Go and take oath in the morning at 10:30. Like Nitish, we will support your government for five years without any disturbance. We, I have inputs that you are being disturbed. You are not going to last. This is a classified information that gets into my book, and it's not being challenged. So I have every right to believe." that kumar swami is not the kumar swami of 2006 he is also matured he's 60 plus now he is looking for an identity of his own and he knows that the bjp is a party which can gobble you up and they and he has seen what has happened with uh, shiv sena in maharashtra so i think people learn lessons and i mean that's 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 my reading i can only tell you what i read i mean they don't share their minds with me or their politics or their strategy with me there are those critics who believe that the very fact that the jds exists is what results in hung assemblies uh, all the time yeah so but the congress see here i have a completely different view if the congress party is arguing for a federal entity india being a federal power or india being a union of states or india being very diverse and plural rahul gandhi goes on and on and on about it endlessly why is it that you uh, can't uh, negotiate with another party which is representing a certain section of the people and which gets legitimate 20% vote so india dhanya i have always argued is a permanent coalition india is so diverse ethnically linguistically caste wise everything is so diverse india should have a permanent coalition like you see in european a lot of european countries where people who have fought elections against each other or they form certain kind of coalition germany has been a coalition for over 40 45 years so why is india you know i mean the, the it is the two national parties which tries to create this narrative oh coalition is bad i think coalition is great look at the coalition that manmohan singh led look at the growth rate that you got devegowda's coalition the highest agricultural growth rate that this country ever saw since 1947 was under devegowda and rightfully so the punjab farmers called him gave uh, the most the best variety of paddy they call it devegowda and still continue to call it devegowda so they harness devegowda 25 years after he but is the reason the why the congress cannot have their coalition also because of very regional po- politics like sidramaiah and the jd and the uh, yeah. jds cannot get it's along more, it's it's more personality based see hmm. if you try and sit down and sort out conceptually i don't think rahul gandhi can be opposed to the idea of a coalition i mean anyway you and you and i know that i don't think the congress is in a position to form a government on its own in this at in delhi they have to sit down with parties to negotiate so the pachmari uh, conference of the congress party officially announced to the world that they are ready for coalitions and ever since they have accepted coalitions so why is it that you make karnataka an isolated case so coalition government is a reality it should become a reality because there are more checks and balances people cannot walk away with anything like you speak of 40% sarkar today you think if there was a coalition government anybody could have walked away with the alleged 40% commission rate that you have been printing in all newspapers you know the card the card rate that you have been printing about corruption you think that would have been possible if there was a coalition set up no your rate would have been lesser perhaps your booty would have been you know every government makes that kind of money you know it's not that all of these other guy characters are doodh mein dule hue characters no their card rate may sort of have varied a little here and a little there and you know the kind of allegations that exist against mr dk shiv kumar and the kind of cases that there are and the tallest of uh, you know public uh, interest uh, uh, activists in karnataka like sr hiremeta raised the biggest of questions against him so it's so diversity But stitching a coalition with the JDS, DKS will come handy for the Congress more than Sidramaiah. I mean DKS, yes DKS because he's heading the party. He seems to have spent a lot. I will give it to him. He has worked extremely hard this election, all that. But see, Karge is the national president of the, and he knows hmm. Karnataka better than a Sidramaiah and a DK put together. He has been in politics for a longer period, and also perhaps maintains a great relationship. with the with the deve gowda there is kesh munipa who is a senior person president also helped the congress in karnataka especially uh, some of the communities to bring it to the congress 
I am not sure about bringing the electorate together, but you know, we, the question of if there is a hung situation mm. and if there has to be smooth negotiations, I don't think, I don't see anybody else leading that negotiation other than Karge. Karge mm. is a solid Karnataka hand and Karge has a certain stature even as a national leader. And if you bypass the Dalit this time, the Congress may be completely over in Karnataka. They may make their demands. Kech Muniappa may make his demand. Karge may put forward his demand. Parmeshwar may put forward his demand. So it's not like just a Lingayat will walk away or a Okaliga will walk away. The Dalits are a sizable chunk and they are, their awareness is something else in Karnataka today. So it's, so it's not like bag. the national channels which ask, is it Siddharamaya or DK Shivakumar? There are other options which the Congress will have to check. Daniel, Daniel, let me compliment you. I read, take you more seriously than any of the national channels or any of the national mainstream newspapers. So you, you have not been saying that. I have not been saying that. So I because think we are, we are trying to bring in different narratives right. into the whole thing. Right? And you know, we are representing, right? yeah, we are representing different narratives, and that's all mm -hmm. we can do as journalists. We say this mm -hmm. exists, this exists, this exists, and all this is not just two, but it's more than two. That's all we can say. So I don't think uh, we, as journalists, we should be saying whether this is going to win or this is no. I am only here to say that these, this is the palette, this is the choice. These are the competing narratives that are happening. And anything can happen in between. Money can play a role. Uh, Kalingayats can play a role. Then, you know, I mean, uh, Hindutva can play a role. Modi as a brand can play a role. Sidramaya may attract that feature. Deva Gauda as a patriarch at 90, campaigning so hard, may attract a certain sympathy. We don't know. All mm. these are part of the game. And we have to observe everything. And it's the, and, I mean, I wrote in my most recent piece that, even the uh, uh, surveys that are being put out this time in Karnataka have become narratives rather than data. Every political party puts out its own survey saying that we are 120, we are 140. Or some BJP says that one day, Congress says that one day. So what's the real thing? We don't know. So you're using, you're weaponizing even data or quote unquote data or the survey mechanism to say that we are winning. That's actually creating a narrative. You are not, mm. that's not the truth. It's also narrative, narration building for your victory. So that is, that is this election. They have put everything on the, uh, on, on the table and they're trying to play with everything. So I don't think it's, uh, we, we know anything yet. And in my recent piece, I said, these surveys trying to read five crore minds with a sample size of 2,000 or 3,000 is the biggest fraud, intellectual fraud can, that can ever happen. So with that, we come to an end. The surveys cannot read five crore minds. I would suggest that people who join the live later, there are many things we discussed. Uh, to just summarize, one is that the BJP is trying a very different political experiment, pushing the social engineering to changing the status quo of caste politics is what Mr. Sugata believes. Will that help the BJP or not? Uh, we don't know. The other is that the Congress has to be questioned on some of the double standards, including not releasing the caste census when they were in power, uh, I think the headline, if I was in a channel, my headline would be uh, JDS may not go with the BJP, considering the friends that they have and considering the legacy that Deva Gauda wants to leave behind and what Kumaraswamy himself has become as a politician. The last headline would be Mr. Kharge will play a very important role when the elections get over, when the results come in and if a coalition is needed. Thank you very much, Mr. Sugata, for joining us. That was a very good conversation that we've had. And hopefully we'll meet you uh, after the results are out. Pleasure. Anytime. Thank you. Thank you.